we already let our minds and hearts run to tomorrow at 2 o'clock for the Mass that will be celebrated um, for Father Tim. And so let us, even on this vigil, keep in our hearts and minds before us the Holy Eucharist and the Mass so central to a priest's life. Tonight is a night of memory, blessed memory, blessed in the presence of family and friends who knew Father Tim, but blessed especially by the Holy Word of God that serves as a light to enlighten all memories that are brought before the Lord in gracious thankfulness as we will do tonight. And in a moment, I'll invite you to come up upon your turn. You'll see just to my left, to your right, at the front of the pew, there's a microphone that is live and adjusted to your needs, but I would invite all of you who wish to share to use the microphone because it's a big room and it's tough to hear without it. But I'd like to kick off a share of your memories, if you will, um, as each and every one of you here have so many memories, so do I. I had a chance to share some of them with Father Tim's retirement party in Hallock, but that was just barely scratching the surface, as I suspect all of you know. But in light of Psalm 92 tonight, I'm mindful of the mighty and towering Cedar of Lebanon that was so important an image uh, to fathers Tim and Dan uh, as part of the family heritage and also part of the biblical tradition. But my memory ties the cedar of Lebanon to the top of that psalm, Psalm 92, in which the cedars of Lebanon are supposed to be singing the praises of God. Well, for ill or for good, Father Dan and Father Tim took that seriously, that they, as cedars of Lebanon, were supposed to sing and sing loudly. <laughs> if any of you have been uh, musical accompanists at Mass, which either Father Dan or Father Tim are, you realize you're not in control. <laughs> you're not in control of the hymn, and you're not in control of the tempo of the hymn. And really, especially when it came to Father Dan, you weren't in control of the key. <laughs> But I had the special privilege of accompanying when they were present at our clergy conferences, which as the years wore on for Father Tim and Father Dan, made um, even the, the, the measures, the count, um, optional for them. Um, because if you were in 4-4 four, four time, they could be doing a waltz for all they cared. Um, it was to their beat, and it was always quite a challenge somewhat amusing, but my greatest memory and joy of this, of course, is when um, the un unmovable object met the irresistible force between Father Tim as pastor of Felton and my mother as the organist. <laughs> Mom was by no one's imagination an accomplished organist, and she would be the first to tell you, even in the middle of the hymn, when she would just stop playing and say, oh, keep singing. <laughs> but when it came to Father Tim being the pastor and Father Mom, or Father my, my mother, a Freudian slip that might well be, but, um, my mother is the organist, it really was quite the something to watch. Because um, he would never say anything from the sanctuary, but if he didn't like the tempo, he'd, he'd up the volume, his own volume, a little more. And of course, when Father Tim increases his volume, this was a tiny church in which the windows would normally have to be replaced after a Sunday Mass because the two of them were going, you know, um, in their own vein, if you will. Mother, of course, would always uh, uh, surrender and just kind of let him take over and she'd come off the pedals and turn down the volume and we really didn't need an organ actually at that point. But it was growing up and, and, uh, and having that image so much that uh, there's just so many things, but in his role in my family, um, one last mom story with Father Tim. My mother never, ever appreciated unexpected guests. She was fine hosting and bringing company in. But if you came unannounced, you, you would be received 
very hospitably, but the minute you closed the door in the driveway to leave, she was saying not such nice things about you. <laughs> the one exception, and for a little kid, this made such an impression on me, because Father Tim would come in unannounced, and when I mean come in, he'd come in <laughs> unannounced. The door would fly open, and he would say, Joyce, where's the dessert? <laughs> Because the first time he ever visited, um, Mom served him strawberry shortcake with real whipped cream. That was to be on the table every time he came, even if he was unannounced. And what I noticed so quickly was, Father Tim, if he was out doing pastoral visits, would just show up, and the door would fly open, Joyce, where's the dessert? And she never, ever got angry about that. Now that made a huge impression on me. And I thought, wow, he's the only one who's getting away with this. <laughs> but the real danger now was that this very special guest who could come in unannounced always had his own set of dessert in the freezer ready to be brought out. Mom always kept a slice of angel food cake and some frozen strawberries in the freezer for when he showed up. Well, that was dangerous for a kid who was hungry all the time. And I only once ate Father Tim's dessert and forever respected the fact that he could show up unannounced and had better have his dessert ready. But he was a very, very important part of my family growing up as he, in time, became such a huge part of everyone's family in his own personal style and profoundly unique way, which was always very grateful. And both of my brothers um, want you to know how much his death means to them as well. So, if you don't, please take your turn in sharing these wonderful memories of such a great man. And again, please, if you will,